Our next story comes from Moonfire. I have so many, but I'll submit my experiences one at a time. I'll start with the basement apartment in 1992. I hate it when landlords or realtors don't tell you that a place is haunted. For five months too long, I stayed at a seemingly nondescript apartment in Nampa, Idaho. Less than a month in, I had my first encounter with my dead roommate. He appeared hovering over me in bed and woke me up. His form was a long, stretched out black, cloudy, swirling mass. He had no face and a skinny little head. He looked down at me a couple of times as though scanning me. Then I found my voice and screamed at it to get out. He flew away backwards into the wall and disappeared. Three weeks later, he came back I felt an angry presence in the room and slept on the couch instead. The next night, I returned to my room. I was awakened later by someone sitting down on the bed, staring at me. My feet even rolled into his form. I was terrified, but too afraid to move. Then I realized he could do something to me if I didn't wake up. I wiggled my toe and woke up. He was gone. And about a month later, I was too. I found out from the landlord that there was a guy in there that had himself before I moved in. Seems like he never quite left. The Teddy Bear is Not What It Seems by Subtly Mystic 98. So I recently moved into my late grandmother's house. It's an old creaky place filled with memories and dusty corners. While exploring the attic, I stumbled upon an old teddy bear. It was a classic vintage looking bear, a bit worn, but still in good condition. It reminded me of the stories my grandmother used to tell me. So I decided to keep it in my room. At first, everything was normal, but after a few nights, I started experiencing odd things. I would wake up in the middle of the night, feeling like somebody was watching me. Each time, I found the teddy bear facing my bed, even though I never remembered positioning it that way. Things got weirder. I started hearing soft humming in the middle of the night, almost like a lullaby. Each time, the sound seemed to be coming from where the teddy bear was. I know it sounds nuts, trust me, but it felt like the bear was humming. One night, I decided to set up my phone to record video, hoping to catch whatever was moving the bear. In the morning, I was horrified. The footage showed the bear's head slowly turning to face the camera, and then the humming started. There was nobody in the room, but me, asleep. As it seems to always go based on my research, I tried getting rid of the bear, but it always reappears. It always goes back to its spot in my room. I even burned it once, but I found it back on my shelf the next day, singed but otherwise intact. And now other strange things are happening too. Doors open and close on their own, items move, and the temperature drops randomly. Those bears' eyes seem to follow me around the room, and sometimes I find it in places I never left it, like watching me from a shelf or sitting in a chair. One day, it was sitting at the dining room table, like it was waiting for me to serve it breakfast or something. I did some digging and found out that my grandmother had a sister who died young, and she owned a teddy bear just like this one. I'm starting to believe that maybe her spirit is attached to the bear. But I'm at my wit's end. I don't feel safe here, and I don't know how to deal with something like this. If you have any advice, do let me know.
The Creepy Music Box by Jennifer K. I recently inherited a few items from my great aunt's estate, and among them was an old ornate music box. It's beautifully crafted, with intricate designs and a delicate ballerina figure inside. I thought it was a charming keepsake, so I placed it on my dresser. That decision has turned my nights into a living nightmare. It started the first night after I brought it home. The music box began playing by itself, well past midnight. The melody was slow and eerie, not at all like the cheerful tune it played when I first opened it. At first I figured it was just a mechanical quirk and didn't really think much of it. But then, I began having these vivid, disturbing dreams. In every dream, I'm in my room and the music box is playing. The ballerina starts moving on its own, its movements jerky and unnatural. Then the room begins to distort, the walls closing in, and a feeling of dread washes over me. Every morning after these dreams, I wake up feeling exhausted, as if I haven't slept at all. And every night, the music box plays its haunting melody at the same time. I've tried to get rid of the thing several times. I smashed it with a hammer, I threw it out. But somehow, it always reappears unscathed, back on my dresser. The dreams are getting worse, more intense. I've started seeing the ballerina figure in my waking hours, out of the corner of my eye, always just a fleeting glimpse. I guess my great aunt had a daughter who died very young, and the music box was hers. I don't really know if that's relevant, but ever since I found this out, the feeling of being watched has intensified. I'm really scared and I don't know what to do. The lack of sleep is affecting my daily life and the fear of what happens when I close my eyes is overwhelming. I don't want to do anything to disrespect a spirit, but I really need my life back. I just don't know what to do. The Haunting of My Childhood Dollhouse by Tiny Terror I recently moved back into my childhood home after my parents passed away. While cleaning out the attic, I found my old dollhouse. It's a detailed Victorian-style house, and I used to spend hours playing with it as a child. Out of nostalgia, I decided to clean it up and display it in my living room. That's when strange things began to happen. Initially, it was small stuff. I'd set up the tiny furniture in a certain way, only to find it rearranged the next day. I thought maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me, but then it escalated. One night, I heard what sounded like a faint, muffled conversation coming from the living room. It was so clear I thought somebody had broken in. I crept downstairs, only to find that the sounds were coming from the dollhouse. As I got closer, the voices stopped abruptly, but all the furniture inside the dollhouse had been moved, and one chair was halfway across one of the little rooms, with somebody, or a doll, resting their hand on it, almost like it had been moving it. Trust me, I know how it sounds, but that's what I saw. Since then, it's been a series of increasingly eerie events. The dolls I placed inside the house appear in different rooms every morning. Sometimes I wake up to find all of them lined up at the foot of my bed, staring at me with their painted eyes. The creepiest part was when I found one of the dolls outside the house, its tiny little hand on the light switch, the day after my light started flickering on and off. It's like whatever's in that dollhouse is starting to affect my real house. I've tried removing the dollhouse from my home, but each time, the paranormal activity escalates until I bring it back. One time, I even took it to a friend's house, at least 50 or 60 miles away from my house. My car died in her driveway, 
When I put it back in the car, the car started. I've done some research, and I found out that the dollhouse was custom made for my great grandmother. She lost a child at a very young age, and some people say that she put all her love and grief into decorating this dollhouse, making it a tribute to the daughter she lost. Whether it's a spirit or just residual energy and tragedy that's strong enough to make all of this happen, I don't really know. I also don't know why nothing ever happened when I was a kid, at least not that I can remember. But whatever's going on, I feel like I'm losing my mind. So if anyone has experienced anything like this or has any advice on how to deal with it, I would definitely love to know because I am desperate for a peaceful night's sleep and a return to normalcy. The Haunted Toy That I Can't Seem To Get Rid Of by Terrified Toy Owner. I never believed in the supernatural until this week. I always loved thrift shopping, and a few days ago, I found this old wooden toy soldier at a local thrift store. It was charming in an antique way, and I thought it would be a nice addition to my shelf. The first night, nothing unusual happened, but on the second night, I started hearing these faint drumming sounds. It sounded like a toy drum, rhythmic and steady. I live alone in a pretty quiet neighborhood, so this was out of the ordinary. I searched my house, but the sound stopped and I couldn't find the source. The next morning, I found the toy soldier on my kitchen counter next to the sink, not where I left it on the shelf. I was a bit unsettled, but I figured I might have moved it and forgotten. I put it back, but then things escalated quickly. The drumming at night became louder and more frequent. I'd find the toy soldier in different places, sometimes on my bedside table, once in my bathroom, and once, chillingly, on my living room couch, as if it was watching TV. I decided that enough was enough, and I threw the toy out. But the next day, there it was, sitting on my shelf as if nothing had happened. I even tried driving it out to a dumpster miles away, but when I got home, it was back. Now other things are happening. My lights flicker and I hear whispers that seem to come from everywhere and nowhere. One night, I swear that toy soldier moved its head to look at me. I'm losing sleep and I constantly feel like I'm being watched. I've tried researching the toy, but there's no information out there. It's like it doesn't exist outside of my house. I'm starting to feel trapped here, a prisoner of this stupid toy soldier that refuses to leave. If anybody knows anything about haunted objects or how to get rid of them, please tell me. I am out of ideas and I'm genuinely terrified of what might happen next. My new apartment came with a guest by Urban Explorer 91. I moved into this old, slightly rundown apartment about a month ago. It's my first place alone and I was excited despite the building's age. That excitement didn't last long. While cleaning out one of the closets, I found an old doll tucked away in a corner. It was one of those porcelain dolls with glassy eyes and a faded Victorian dress. It gave me the creeps, but I figured that it might be worth something, so I kept it. I kept it out, not somewhere where I had to see it all the time, but not thrown in a corner either. Almost immediately, weird things started happening. I would hear soft footsteps at night, but whenever I checked, there was nothing. My things would go missing and then turn up in odd places. I thought maybe I was just adjusting to living alone until one night. 
I woke up to the strangest sensation of being watched. The doll was on my dresser, which I could swear was not where I left it. Its eyes seemed to follow me. I locked it in a drawer and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, it was back on the dresser. I tried to get rid of it multiple times. I threw it away, left it far from my building, even tried giving it to another thrift store. But somehow, it always came back. It would be sitting there on my dresser, like it was waiting for me. Things have gotten worse now. I hear whispering and the temperature drops drastically whenever the doll is near. I've seen shadows moving out of the corner of my eye, and the doll's expression has seemed to change. Its smile is growing wider and more sinister. I've looked into the history of this building, and I found out that a young girl died here in the late 1800s. Some say her spirit never left, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe she's attached to this doll. I'm posting this because I honestly don't know what to do. I know it sounds crazy, but it's really happening. I'm scared to stay, but I can't afford to leave. If anyone has any experience with this kind of thing, let me know. I bought a haunted doll at a yard sale, and now I'm terrified. By user Haunted Collector 123. Last weekend, I did something I now deeply regret. I'm a bit of a collector of oddities. Old books, vintage toys, you name it. So when I saw this peculiar old doll at a yard sale, I was immediately drawn to it. The doll was porcelain, with a cracked face, and this eerie, almost lifelike gaze. The seller, an old woman, seemed eager to get rid of it, and gave me a warning that I foolishly ignored. She's got a spirit, she said. I laughed it off. Big mistake. The first few nights were uneventful, but then things started getting weird. I kept the doll on a shelf in my living room, one morning, I found it on the kitchen table. I live alone, and I always lock my doors, so this really freaked me out. I thought maybe I was just forgetful, and I put it back. But then it happened again, and again. Each time, the doll appeared in a different place. One night, I woke up to a soft tapping sound. When I opened my eyes, the doll was on my bedside table, staring at me. I was paralyzed with fear. I don't remember falling asleep again, but in the morning, the doll was back on its shelf. I tried to get rid of it. I threw it in the trash, but the next day, there it was, back on the shelf. I even tried burning it, but the fire wouldn't catch. It was like the flames avoided the doll. Now I'm hearing whispers at night. My lights flicker and my TV turns on by itself. The worst part? I swear I've seen the doll's expression change, like it's grinning at me. I'm at my wit's end. I've reached out to the woman I bought it from, but she's moved, and nobody knows where. I've contacted a local paranormal expert, but they haven't gotten back to me yet. I don't know what to do. I'm scared to stay in my own house, but I feel like the doll won't let me leave. If anyone has any advice or has experienced anything similar, please, I need help. Ghosts and the Dying by user McCord posted to r slash ghost stories. When my dad was dying, he was very much not moving a lot or saying much, and had been like that for days. It was only ourselves in the room, when he suddenly sat up, seemingly quite happy, and started talking to his mother, 
I asked him if he was okay and what was going on. He told me both of his parents were there. He apparently talked to his deceased sister last, and the next day, he passed away. About four years ago, a relation of mine, an aunt, was dying in the hospital. Her three sons had visited and were staying locally, as their mother wasn't going to last much longer. They were all married and had moved away from their hometown. Unfortunately, overnight, one of the sons actually passed away tragically. It was decided that they would not tell my aunt because she was too near to death as it was. Seconds before my aunt passed away, she looked into the corner of the room quizzically and in a confused tone, called out her recently deceased son's name. It was as if she could see him waiting for her, but couldn't understand why he was there in spirit rather than in person. The family liked to think that he was waiting for her. The Siren at Giant's Causeway My encounter at Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland was as bewildering as it was chilling, a stark contrast to the natural beauty of the place. Known for its unique basalt columns, Giant's Causeway is a popular tourist attraction, steeped in myth and legend. But what I experienced there was far from the tales of giants I had heard. It was a cool, foggy morning when I set out to explore the causeway. The fog was thick, enveloping the landscape in a mysterious veil, making the hexagonal columns appear otherworldly. I was captivated by the surreal beauty and the rhythmic sound of the waves crashing against the rocks. As I walked further along the coast, away from the main tourist paths, the fog seemed to grow denser. The sounds of the ocean became more pronounced, and I could hear what seemed like a melody intertwined with the waves. It was a hauntingly beautiful song, unlike anything I had ever heard. Drawn by the melody, I found myself moving toward the water's edge. The song grew louder, more enchanting. And that's when I saw her. Through the mist, there was a figure sitting on one of the rocks just off the shore. She was ethereal, her hair long and dark, her skin pale against the dark sea. She seemed to be the source of the captivating song. I stood there, mesmerized by her presence and her voice. It felt as though the song was wrapping around me, pulling me closer to the water. I took a step forward my mind foggy as if in a trance. Suddenly, a loud wave crashed onto the shore, snapping me out of my daze. I looked again, but the figure was gone. The song had ceased, leaving only the natural sounds of the ocean. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized how close I had been to the water's edge. I hurried back to the main path, glancing over my shoulder half expecting to see the figure again, but there was only the sea and the fog. Back at my accommodation, I shared my experience with the host. She told me about old sailors tales of sirens in the waters around Ireland, mythical creatures who lured sailors to their doom with their enchanting music. I don't know if what I saw was a siren or just a figment of my imagination, influenced by the eerie atmosphere of the causeway. But that melody and the sight of the mysterious figure have stayed with me. The Demon House, submitted by subscriber Freddy. You can call me Freddy. I'm from a small town in South Carolina, and I've been dealing with the paranormal all my life. I'm 28 years old, and I've always been a believer in things like ghosts, spirits, and demons, even vampires and werewolves. I've had many paranormal encounters. 
My dad said I was born with a veil over my face. It took me a long time to learn how to control it. For years, I would cry and lose sleep over the encounters I would have. And it didn't help that my mom never believed me. But with years of practice, I learned how to keep them away, especially the evil ones, because they seemed especially attracted to me. My first encounter, I think I was about nine or 10 years old, and I was laying in bed asleep one night. All of a sudden, I was awake. I felt like somebody was standing over me. At first, I thought it was my dad because he would always come and check on me. I looked to the side and I saw a tall, dark figure standing over my bed. I don't know how I know, but it was looking at me. I couldn't see any facial detail, but the energy I felt coming from it was very masculine. I quickly realized it wasn't my dad because he was short and thick. Whoever this was was tall and skinny. I was so scared, but something told me to just lay still and don't move. So I laid there for what felt like hours until finally my dad turned my lights on. I told him what I saw and he stayed with me until I went back to sleep. From then on, things didn't get any better. For years, I would experience sleep paralysis, noises. I would be scratched, I'd wake up with bruises. Not all the spirits I encountered were bad. Sometimes I would wake up at night crying about my baby about how I couldn't find her and someone took her from me. I know I probably sounded crazy because I was 13 and I didn't have a baby. Also, I remember one time I was depressed and I was at my aunt's house alone. I was praying to God, asking him to give me a sign that someone loved me. And all of a sudden, one of my aunt's angel figurines fell and the front door flew open. Most of the activity that happened to me happened in a trailer that my family owned. I never looked up the history of the land or anything, but I hated that trailer. I was literally tortured there. I was a 15 to 16 year old kid whose dad still had to stay with her until she fell asleep because I was so scared. I was pretty sure that house had a demon in it, but I never saw it, but I felt it. For some reason, it seemed like it was attached to me. I could feel it. I knew that it wanted to hurt me. My mom never believed me, she just thought I was crazy. That was until she sold it. The lady that bought it was trying to fix it up, but she just kept having bad luck with it. Eventually, she decided to sell it, and she called my mom and offered to let her buy it back. My mom told her that she wouldn't be interested in buying it back, but she did ask why she wanted to sell it since she'd only had it for a few months. The lady told my mom that something evil lives in that house, and she wanted it out of her life as soon as possible before something bad happened to her. I guess then she realized I wasn't running to her room every night terrified to sleep on the floor at 17 for fun. The Vanishing Hitchhiker. I have to tell you about this wild experience I had. I've heard urban legends about vanishing hitchhikers, but I never expected to encounter one myself. This happened a few months back when I was driving home late at night from a friend's place. It's a pretty rural area, lots of winding roads with woods on either side. As I'm driving, I see this figure on the side of the road thumb out, looking for a ride. It's not unusual to see hitchhikers here, but at this hour, it was kind of strange. Anyway, I'm a decent person, so I stopped. It was this young woman, maybe in her early 20s, wearing a white dress, which was odd given that it was pretty chilly outside. She gets into the car and thanks me, saying she just needs to get to the next town over. She's quiet, kind of distant, but I figured she's just tired or scared, being alone at night and all. As we drive, I make small talk, but she barely responds. She just keeps looking straight ahead. So then it gets really bizarre. I'm glancing back and forth between the road and her in the mirror, you know, just checking if she's okay. At one point, 
I look back and she's just gone. Just vanished, no sign of her. The passenger seat was empty and the car door never opened. I even pulled over to make sure I wasn't losing my mind, but there was no one there. I drove to the next town, completely freaked out. When I got there, I stopped at a diner to calm my nerves and get some coffee. I told a waitress there what happened, and she didn't even bat an eye. She told me a story about a young woman who died on that road years ago in a car accident. She was wearing a white dress, the same as the hitchhiker I picked up. Now I don't know if it was a ghost or what, but the encounter shook me. Now, whenever I drive that road at night, I can't help but look for her, wondering if she's still out there, trying to get a ride to a home she never reached. A dream that gives me chills by user Medical Inevitable 99, posted to r slash ghost stories. About 10 years ago, I had a dream that still gives me chills every time I think about it. Some important backstory. A friend of mine passed away when he was 19 from a sudden illness. His name was Kevin. A few years after he passed, my boyfriend and I moved in with a friend who was Kevin's best friend. We shared a one bedroom apartment and had both of our beds in the same room. Rent is expensive in your early 20s, okay? One night I was asleep and dreaming. I can't remember the beginning of it, but my dream suddenly changed. It got really bright and I was walking up a set of stairs leading to an apartment door. I opened the door and there was Kevin sitting on the couch in the living room of this brightly lit apartment. I said hi to him and sat down on the other couch facing him. He said hi back, smiling. I started asking him how he was and said that we all missed him. He said he was great and that he missed us too, that he's keeping an eye on us from where he is. Anytime I asked him about where he was, he would say that he can't talk about it or he would have to leave. I said, well, we don't have to talk about it. He said we shouldn't be sad about his sudden passing and to live our lives and be happy, to love one another, things like that. After a couple of minutes, I suddenly woke up. It's the middle of the night. I looked around the room. My boyfriend was snoring away and my roommate was asleep in his bed. I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I just couldn't shake the feeling that Kevin was somehow still in the room, as if something was watching me. The dream just felt way too real. While looking around the room, I said, Kevin? Out loud, in almost a whisper. My roommate's head lifted off his pillow suddenly, and he turned around to face me. He said, did you just say Kevin? I responded with something like, oh yeah, sorry. I just had this strange dream about him. He froze and then said, I just had a dream about him too. I asked him to tell me what happened in his dream. We had the exact same dream at the exact same time. To this day, I get chills every time I think about it. Hate by user Jalcott, posted to r slash ask reddit in a comment. I'm a psychiatric nurse. Early in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. There was a resident that I'll call Marion Duchesne. He was an elective mute, which simply means that he didn't, wouldn't, or couldn't talk, but there were no pathological findings as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the notable exception of being close to seven feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the military when he was 19. 
After boot camp, he was stationed somewhere in the south. One night, he just vanished. It was declared an AWOL for years, and finally he was declared missing and then dead. Ten years later, a seven-foot-tall man walked into a VA hospital emergency room in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Duchesne, and I've been dead for ten years. Those were the last words he ever spoke. He was covered in dust, and he was wearing the same clothes that he had been reported to be wearing the night he vanished. His social security number had not been used, and he had no identification on his person. However, they were able to identify him, I guess via fingerprints. He was well fed and in good health, except for his refusal to speak. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man, and that whomever was claiming to be him simply could not be. They said he was a haint, a malicious ghost of the South, and a stand-in for their dead relative, and demanded not to be contacted again. Marion paced all day, every day, not in a frantic way, but just lumbering up and down the halls and outside. He smiled all the time and would always be moving his mouth in a way that indicated talking, but he was dead silent. He had this unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open, as if he were laughing heartily, but not even a breath could be heard. If told to go to the dining room for a meal, he would go and eat. But if nobody told him, he just kept pacing, never indicating hunger. If offered a cigarette, he would smoke it in an oddly formal way, almost delicately, if that makes sense. But he never seemed to crave smoking. The man wanted nothing. If I talked to him, he appeared to listen, periodically throwing his head back in that laughter-mimicking way of his. There was nothing to do for this man. Various medications were tried, but they did not affect him either positively or negatively. Occupational therapy did nothing, because Marion would just grin, and unless told to stay put, he would get up and start pacing again. On my last day at that job, on my way to something better, the last thing I saw was Marion, pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh, Later, I wondered if all along I'd been dealing with a ghost. And all these years later, I still don't know. Real experiences I've had while working as a nurse by user Actual Consequence 211, posted to r slash ghost stories. In my mid-twenties, I worked at a subacute rehab facility. Generally, these places exist to help those who are struggling after an accident, surgery, or something like that, regain their mobility and quality of life, with the help of physical therapy and round-the-clock nursing care. I worked in the dementia unit, these patients were long-term, and most ended up living out the rest of their days there. Although it was called the dementia unit, our patients were comprised of those suffering from permanent or long-term brain-related conditions. These included dementia, Alzheimer's, comas, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and brain tumors. These are the experiences that I had while working there. Number one, a disembodied hand. I had just clocked in for the evening and received a report from the day shift nurse. I was standing at the end of the hallway with my back against the wall, reviewing the notes I had taken from the previous nurse. Whilst reading over my slip of paper, I felt what could only be described as a hand dragging its fingers horizontally across my abdomen. I jerked back and looked around, but I was completely alone. Number two, the call light symphony. Although I don't have a particular story about call lights, it was very normal to have call lights in empty rooms triggered, even in rooms where the wires that were attached to the call button were unplugged from the wall. Some nights, the nurses would be forced to respond to several phantom calls from empty rooms. 
Number three, the empty room ghost. At the very end of one of our halls contained a habitually empty room. The heat and air conditioning unit was broken, so patients were never placed there. The nurses and aides would use that room for privacy during personal phone calls, to go to the bathroom in peace, or do whatever else required some seclusion. One evening, I headed into that room's bathroom to touch up my makeup and fix my hair. I left the bathroom door slightly ajar while going about my business. I was putting my hair up in a bun when the bathroom door slammed shut behind me. Mid-heart attack, I spun around and jerked the door back open. The room was empty. The time it would have taken a human to exit the room would have been much longer than what it took me to open the bathroom door. I'd also like to note that there was no furniture in that room, nothing that a human could have hidden behind. I'm convinced it was not a living person who slammed that door. Number four, the last farewell. One patient we had residing in the long-term unit was a middle-aged woman with severe Down syndrome. She was mostly non-verbal save for a few words that she would utter randomly. She was very sweet and always had a smile on her face. It was my turn to help her eat dinner that night. She didn't have the motor skills to eat properly, so I spoon-fed her while we caught up on cartoons on her TV set. But this particular night, she acted completely out of character. I didn't notice at first because I was engrossed in the show we were watching. I failed to notice her attempts to get my attention. She finally resorted to using grunts to call me away from the TV screen. When I did finally notice, she seemed overjoyed with something. Her mouth was stretched into a wide grin, and she was pointing at an empty corner in the back of her room. I could clearly see the corner, but nothing else. I looked back and forth, between her and the corner, but I couldn't understand what she was trying to communicate. She was pointing, giggling, and waving at apparently nothing in the corner. I tried asking her what she was trying to show me with simple yes and no questions that she could nod or shake her head to. I became uneasy with her actions because I knew that she was seeing something that I could not. After I finished up feeding her, I walked back out to the hallway and was immediately approached by a fellow nurse. My stomach sank and I felt queasy when she told me the next door neighbor of the woman I was just feeding had passed away during dinner time. Number five, the window watcher. This is not my story, but it was told to me by a fellow nurse. My friend, let's call her Mary, worked the night shift at the same rehab as I, but this story takes place years before I was hired there. Mary was close to one of her patients and she went out of her way to make her feel special. The patient was an elderly woman with no living family and was chronically lonely. Let's call the patient Emily. When Mary bonded with Emily, it became a habit of Emily's to wait by her room's window, which faced the employee parking lot. So when she saw Mary walking up to the building, she could wave. This became a special occasion for Emily, and the two would wave to one another before and after Mary's shift while she traveled to and from the employee parking lot. Then Emily fell ill and was unable to get out of bed for a while. Every time Mary pulled up for work, she would check to see if Emily was waiting by the window. When she didn't see her, she would know walking in that Emily was still sick. This went on for weeks. Mary would pull into the parking lot, hoping to see her sweet patient up and out of bed and waiting patiently to wave to her. But then one day, Mary showed up at work and she did see Emily standing at her window, peering out over the employee parking lot. Mary was thrilled and hopped out of her car and gave Emily a gleeful wave. But Emily stood motionless and didn't react to Mary's exuberant greeting. Puzzled, Mary headed into the building, only to quickly find out that Emily had passed away earlier that day. The Story That Made Me Believe by user doublechard8733 posted to r slash ghost stories. 
can you tell me the story that made you believe in ghosts? Here's my story. I used to work as a bartender on a military base, and one of the most memorable nights was Halloween. We had gone all out with the decorations, including a skeleton perched on a barrel. Whenever somebody passed by it, it would giggle and pretend to pour a bottle down its throat while spouting pirate sayings. One eerie night, as I was closing up the bar all by myself, I switched off the decorations and locked all the doors. Just when I thought everything was in order, a strange sensation made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Startled, I turned around, prompted by the sound of somebody clearing their throat. The skeleton suddenly sprang to life as if somebody had just walked past it. I was perplexed because I knew that I had just turned it off and there was no one else in the bar. I decided to investigate and found the switch in the off position, which left me baffled. Without giving it much thought, I removed the batteries and stashed them in my pocket. While counting down the till, an unsettling feeling of being watched crept over me. Finally done with my tasks, I was ready to leave for home. However, just as I approached the employee exit, I heard the pirate skeleton's laughter once again. Without a second thought, I bolted to my car. Something told me to go by user call my bluff posted to r slash backwoods creepy. I've debated posting this for a long time, but never got around to it, mainly because I try to keep this memory out of my brain. This might be a long one, but this is a creepy thing that happened to me about four years ago. For starters, I grew up in Southwest Saskatchewan and I moved on to my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in though that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I was always dreading having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent our pasture space and so we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either, and there were tons. Every so often when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part as she was huge but every so often she would wander elsewhere on the property to scout and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go potty. This is still a problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for damn near half an hour, just so she would go and not go in the house. Another problem of hers, huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside, but I really wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started to get a little bit frustrated, and I would repeat, go, go potty, every time she would get distracted from her objective. 
It was dark, I was cold and annoyed, and to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but I shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, go, go, go potty, through the rain to my small fuzzy white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture and suddenly in my left ear, I heard it, go. Now one thing you should know about me is I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot as I was mostly just confused at what I had just heard. I tried telling myself that I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a moo from a cow that I had heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard, go, go. It sounded unnatural. It was like it came from somebody who had never spoken a word before, a raspy, deep monotone. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio, but of course there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said, and whatever it was had started repeating it, as though it had been taught a new word and now it was its favorite. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then, again from behind me, go, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds. And at this point, I remember shouting out loud, all right, don't have to tell me twice. As I picked up my little fur ball and made a dash for my front door, I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. Puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all and happy that mum wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what I had just been through. She sent my uncle over to check the pasture, but soon after he told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he would check the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. I suppose that explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as at the time I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me the other day that they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off the farm. I just couldn't be in that house alone anymore and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia that this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me and were out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good, and I finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you have any idea what this would have been. There's no chance that it would have been someone in our field. We were pretty far away from town and neighbors, and we have cameras that would have seen anybody enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they're capable of speaking. Any ideas? This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, 
but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something, but there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened and it has always stayed with me. The haunted doll that changes positions. All right, so this is a bit out there, but it's totally true. I never believed in haunted objects or anything like that, but then I got this old doll from my grandmother's attic, and let me tell you, it's freaky. So this doll, it's one of those old porcelain ones, pretty, but kind of creepy with those glassy eyes. I put it on a shelf in my living room, just as a decoration. Nothing weird at first, but then things started happening. I'd come into the room and the doll would be in a different position than I left it. At first, I thought I was just being forgetful. Maybe I moved it and didn't remember, right? But then it kept happening more and more. The doll's head would be turned or its arms would be in a different position. It was subtle, but noticeable. One day, I even found it sitting on my couch. Now, I live alone, so there's no way someone else was moving it. And that's when I started to get really creeped out. I mean, how does a doll just move on its own? So I did a little experiment. I positioned the doll in a certain way and took a picture. The next day, sure enough, it had moved. And it wasn't like it fell over or anything like that. It was sitting up posed differently. I showed my friends and they thought I was pranking them, but I swear it's true. This doll was changing positions all on its own. I even tried locking it in a cabinet and somehow it would still end up somewhere else in the room. After a few weeks of this, I couldn't handle it anymore. It was too weird, too unsettling. So I wrapped the doll up and put it back in my grandmother's attic. Since then, nothing strange has happened, but I still get chills thinking about it. I don't know if it was really haunted or what, but that doll definitely had a mind of its own. No more antique dolls for me, thank you very much.
My old friend doesn't exist. By user Sunflower Monarch 21. Posted to r slash glitch in the matrix. So I've been stewing on this for a couple of weeks now. Recently, I randomly thought of an old friend that I hadn't seen since graduation. We went to different high schools, but had a lot of mutual friends and spent a fair amount of time together. So I went to look him up and I couldn't find any trace of him on social media. Odd, but not alarming. I found his dad and sister, but neither of their profiles mentioned anything about him, even on posts about or with other family members. I reached out to a mutual friend who went to his high school and asked if she had heard anything about him over the years. She had no clue who I was talking about. Even after I showed her a picture of the three of us at a concert, she said she didn't recognize him. They graduated in the same class, so I went and found their senior yearbook online to look him up. He's not in it, anywhere. He was a varsity athlete, had tons of friends. I have plenty of pictures of him. He was at my high school graduation as a spectator and no one remembers him but me. It seems like he doesn't even exist to his own family. I don't get how a whole person just seems to have been wiped from existence and it's really freaking me out. At this point, I have reached out to five friends who have zero idea who he is. My boyfriend understood Japanese for a minute by user lopsided buffalo 538 posted to r slash glitch in the matrix. This is short, but it's really been weirding me out ever since it happened, and I thought maybe it belonged here. A couple of nights ago, my boyfriend and I were sitting in our living room watching One Piece. My boyfriend gets up to grab a snack from the kitchen while we let the episode keep playing. Our kitchen and living room are separated by a thin wall as the kitchen leads to the living room, so he could still hear the episode well in case any action picked up. Well, one character says something along the lines of, why do you care about this woman anyway? She's a criminal. Mind you, we were watching subbed, so this is all in Japanese. I'm reading the subtitles, but my boyfriend can't see them at the moment. But after the character asks that question, my boyfriend yells in from the kitchen, because she's my friend, dumbass. I pause the episode immediately and walk into the kitchen and to ask how my boyfriend knew what they were saying. He got this look of realization, followed by total confusion and then horror. His exact response was, I don't know, I just, I don't know. He's never spoken another language other than English, never taken any Japanese classes, never even downloaded Duolingo. We're both totally creeped out by it. Some suggested that he watched the episode without me, but he didn't. We don't care if each other is a couple of episodes ahead sometimes, so if he does watch ahead, he'll usually just tell me, but he says he did not watch ahead this time. He said he didn't even realize it was Japanese for a minute until I came in and brought it up. So weird. My three-year-old knew I was pregnant by user wrongdoer leading 8029, posted to r slash glitch in the matrix. A few years ago, when my daughter was three, I decided to go back to school and become a nurse. My husband and I were in no way trying for a baby whatsoever. I was on birth control and we were very careful. I walk into her preschool one day to find the director and her teachers telling me congratulations with big smiles on their faces. I used to work as a preschool teacher here, so a lot of these people were close friends of mine. 
I ask them what they're congratulating me for, and they tell me that my daughter announced to everyone that mommy has a little sister in her tummy. I laughed it off and told them all I was sorry to disappoint them, but that just wasn't true. My daughter and I went home and talked about it. I told her mommy didn't have a baby in her tummy, and she just kept pointing at my belly and saying, yes, you do, as if I were lying to her. A few days later, I woke up to someone touching my belly. My daughter has the bottom of my shirt pulled up with her hand resting on my belly while she rubs it gently and says, baby sister, what are you doing hiding in there? It was really sweet and I just assumed she really wanted a little sister. She had never expressed any interest in having a sibling prior to this and we never discussed it, but I figured that's what it had to be. We had the talk again and she got really upset with me. She told me she's seen her before and she's in there. She told me that her sister looks different than us and has blonde hair and blue eyes with little holes in her cheeks, AKA dimples. My daughter, husband, and I all have very dark hair, chocolate brown eyes, and no dimples. I talk to her about wanting a sibling and tell her that when I finish school, we will try to give her a little brother or sister. Again, she's frustrated and yelling, I already have a sister. I was expecting my period to start within the next week like clockwork. It did not. I took a pregnancy test and just stared at that faint positive result for what felt like forever. I was completely in shock. I was on birth control, so immediately I called my doctor and they saw me the next day. It was estimated that I was four weeks and six days pregnant. I gave birth to a blonde hair, blue eyed little girl with the sweetest dimples. This experience has always blown my mind. I found my sister's missing necklace by user scary service 666 posted to r slash glitch in the matrix. My sister moved multiple states away three years ago. Her husband gives her very thoughtful jewelry pieces every Mother's Day. They're always extremely sentimental and bespoke to convey a specific sentiment or memory. Two years ago, he gave her a gold necklace with a heart carved inside with their family's initials and year of birth, with diamonds to the center where the heart meets a point because it's their daughter's birthstone. Since being given that gift, she has never left the state to visit home. She has also never been to my current house even before leaving. I also live pretty far from home and family hasn't made the visit, but I've lived here for seven years now and I haven't moved or spent long visits with my family, just daytime drop-ins. My sister's necklace went missing sometime in spring last year. She thought it might have broken and fallen off while out and about, and she was very distressed about it because it was an expensive gift and she felt horrible about it going missing. When we chatted about it, she actually told me that she wasn't going to tell her husband about it until she had searched everywhere possible. The entire house, the car, her workplace. She even called the stores that she shops at regularly, asking if it was found and turned in, but nothing. Just this week, I was pulling out old clothes and shoes to donate. My son went through a growth spurt and I got wider and I figured that it was time to clean house. I was pulling out all the shoes and purses at the bottom of my closet. And there, in the very back of my closet, I found my sister's necklace. There's absolutely no way that this could have ended up there. My sister has not come home to visit and there's no way this would have ended up in our state, in my house, without her having mailed it personally. And she's never mailed me anything, besides sending gifts directly from the seller that she never personally touched. And it's not as though it's just a similar looking piece or a mass produced item. This was specifically carved with their birth years and initials and their daughter's diamond birthstone. But it gets even stranger. 
I immediately FaceTime her when I find it. I was already trying to figure out how on earth it would have come to be in my closet. I haven't gone to her state yet. My son hasn't visited there. Our parents had, but they went before she got the gift. When she picked up and I showed her what I had found, I was honestly bracing myself because I was sure she was going to be just as confused and have a million questions I couldn't answer. But when I showed her what I found, she set the phone down to put herself in full view and pulled out her necklace from under her blouse. She had her necklace. Not just that, but she had no recollection of losing it. No memory at all of talking to me about losing it, searching her house, calling shops. In fact, she was positive that she's always had it in her jewelry box and thought that I was being weird about finding the same one because it was likely a really common necklace. When I pointed out that it was not common and that it had their same initials and birth years, she just shrugged and said that it was a coincidence, but not all that strange. When I pressed it, she laughed and assumed I was pulling a prank of some kind, which would be extremely out of my character. I am not one to pull pranks. She asked if I had made it as some kind of joke. I am at a total loss here. I feel like reality is just all jumbled up and I'm the only one who notices that it's off. I was so confused, so I called our mom and I told her what happened. I told her the whole thing, asking if she recalled her losing the necklace. I was sure if she did, it would have come up in their calls as well. She didn't recall anything, but the way she acted in the call was even stranger. She just goes, well, these things happen. Don't let it drive you crazy. Our family is just sensitive to these things. And then wouldn't elaborate on it, which is also very unlike her character. How is this possible? By Rocker Chicks Rule, posted to r slash glitch in the matrix. In June of 2018, my daughter and I walked up the road a quarter of a mile away to the local waffle house for breakfast. Since we were walking, I only took a house key and my debit card and placed them in my jeans pocket. After breakfast, we walked up to the cashier with the ticket. I paid for the meal, then we left and proceeded to walk back home. When we were almost home, I reached in my pants pocket to grab my key to unlock the door and noticed that my debit card was not with the key. I panicked, so we turned around before unlocking the door and went back to the Waffle House to see if I had left the card with the cashier. We walked quickly back, also looking along the side of the road in case I dropped it. Once we got back to the Waffle House, the cashier said she gave my card back to me and nobody had turned in a card possibly found on the floor. I felt sick and all I could think of was hurrying back home and calling the credit card company to cancel my card. We proceeded back toward home again and finally made it there. I unlocked the door and walked past the kitchen and I noticed from the corner of my eye a piece of paper folded on the countertop. After opening the paper, I was shocked to discover that it was my receipt from the Waffle House wrapped around my debit card. The card and the receipt were back at home before I made it home. Just so you know, my daughter was walking behind me when I unlocked the door and entered the house, so she didn't have any time to place my card and receipt in the kitchen if she had had it. What the heck? The Dark Watchers of the Santa Lucia Mountains by Mike. I've always been a rational person, not one to believe in ghost stories or folklore. That was until my encounter with something inexplicable in the Santa Lucia Mountains of California. The locals call them the Dark Watchers, and until that day, I thought they were just part of an old wives' tale. 
It was a late autumn afternoon, and I had decided to hike the rugged trails of the Santa Lucias. The scenery was breathtaking, with rolling hills and the distant view of the Pacific. As an avid photographer, I was hoping to capture the sunset over the ocean. As the day wore on, the sun dipped lower, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple. I had ventured quite far and decided that it was time to head back. That's when I noticed something unusual on a ridge against the setting sun. It looked like a human figure, tall and shrouded in darkness, standing motionless and staring into the distance. I thought it might be another hiker admiring the view, so I raised my camera to take a photo. But when I looked through the lens, the figure had vanished. I lowered the camera, and there it was again, still and silent. A chill ran down my spine. I had heard hikers mention the dark watchers, tall, shadowy figures seen at twilight, standing atop the ridges and peaks of the Santa Lucias. They were said to be harmless, but those who tried to approach them or caught their attention would suffer misfortune. Feeling uneasy, I quickened my pace, but every time I glanced back, the figure was there, always at a distance, a dark silhouette against the fading light. I remembered one of the local tales warning that you should never look directly at a dark watcher, but it was too late for that. The path back seemed longer than I remembered. The shadows grew longer and the air turned colder. I felt a sense of being watched, not just by the figure I had seen, but by others that I couldn't see. The silence of the mountains was overwhelming, broken only by the occasional rustle of wind. As darkness fell, I finally emerged from the trail, the lights of my car a welcome sight. I drove home without looking back, but the feeling of being watched lingered. I've since read more about the Dark Watchers. They are part of local Native American folklore. Descriptions of these Watchers date back over a century, with stories of them appearing at twilight, observing those who wander the mountains. Some say they are spirits of the ancient native tribes, ancestors watching over the lands. Others believe that they are something more sinister, a warning to those who trespass into their domain. Whatever they are, my experience in the Santa Lucia Mountains left me with far more questions than answers. Diary in the Woods I have always been drawn to the solitude of the forests, finding peace in the quiet and the ancient towering trees. But during one of my solitary hikes last autumn, I stumbled upon something that still puzzles and fascinates me to this day. A diary, seemingly new, with entries that dated back centuries. The day was cool and overcast, perfect for a long walk through the dense woods near my hometown. I was far off any marked trail, enjoying the feeling of being completely alone with nature. That's when I saw it, half buried under a pile of fallen leaves, a small leather-bound book. Curiosity peaked, I picked it up and brushed off the leaves. The cover was in pristine condition, with no signs of wear or age. It struck me as odd, considering where I had found it. I opened it, expecting blank pages, or perhaps some hiker's recent notes. Instead, I found entries, written in a neat script. The first dated in the early 1700s. Each entry detailed everyday life, thoughts, and observations. Some were mundane, talking about the weather or chores. Others were more intimate speaking of love, loss, and hope. As I turned the pages, the dates progressed through the centuries, each entry in a different hand, but all maintaining a consistent, elegant style. The most recent entry was dated just a few days prior. It spoke of the changing seasons and the beauty of the forest, much like my own reflections. 
It was surreal, reading these words that could have been my own, in a diary that seemed to transcend time. I sat there for a long time, reading through the entries, captivated by the voices from the past. The diary felt like a bridge through time, connecting me to people who had walked these woods centuries ago. As the sun began to set, I realized I needed to head back. I carefully placed the diary back where I had found it, under the leaves. It felt like it belonged there, a secret part of the forest, waiting to be discovered by the next passerby. Back home, I couldn't shake the image of the diary from my mind. I did some research on the history of the area, but found nothing that explained the diary or its entries. I've gone back to that spot in the forest several times, searching for the diary, but it's like it just vanished, just like it appeared. It remains one of the most profound mysteries I've ever encountered. And while I'm still slightly unsettled about it, I'm grateful for the experience. The Woods of Aroostook I've always been drawn to the serene beauty of Aroostook County, Maine. The dense forests, the rolling hills, and the sense of isolation. It's like stepping into another world. Last summer, I decided to take a solo camping trip, seeking solitude and a break from my hectic city life. Little did I know, I was about to encounter something beyond the realm of normalcy. Something that would forever change my perception of the world. I arrived at a secluded campsite nestled deep in the woods. The first couple of days were idyllic, just me, the chirping birds, and the rustling leaves. However, on the third night, things took a bizarre turn. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a strange feeling washed over me. The forest, usually alive with nocturnal sounds, fell eerily silent. I sat by the dying campfire trying to shake off the unease. That's when I first heard it, a faint whispering, like voices carried by the wind. At first, I thought it was my imagination, the product of being alone in the woods, but the whispers grew louder, more distinct. What truly sent chills down my spine was when I realized the whispers were reciting memories, my memories, secrets I had never shared with anyone. I stood up, my heart pounding in my chest, and scanned the shadowy tree line. There was nothing but the gentle swaying of the trees. The whispers, however, continued, growing more personal, more accusatory. They spoke of regrets from my past, mistakes I had buried deep within. It felt as though the trees themselves were speaking, their leaves rustling with every word spoken about my life. In a panic, I decided to leave, to escape the accusing chorus of the woods. As I hastily packed my gear, the whispers morphed into a cacophony of voices all speaking at once. I couldn't understand them anymore, but the tone was unmistakable. It was angry, almost vengeful. I hurried through the dark forest, guided only by the beam of my flashlight and the overwhelming desire to get as far away as possible. The whispers followed me, echoing through the trees. It was as if the entire forest was alive, aware of my presence, and wanted me gone. Finally, I reached my car, threw my gear in the back seat, and drove away without looking back. As I left the boundaries of the forest, the whispers faded away, leaving me in stunned silence. I haven't been back to Aroostook since that night. The experience left me with a lot of questions. What were those whispers? Was it all in my head? A product of isolation? Or had I stumbled upon something truly unexplainable? All I know is I haven't been back, and I don't think I will be anytime soon. A 
A Chilling Encounter in the Woods of Maine by Tamara. I live in Maine, and for those who don't know, the woods here can be pretty dense and expansive. I've always been an avid hiker, often going on trails deep into the forest. Last Saturday, I decided to take a new trail. It was in a more secluded part of the woods, and I was excited to explore it. About two hours into the hike, I started feeling this odd sensation, like I was being watched. I stopped, listened, but only heard the usual sounds of the forest. Shrugging it off, I continued. But that feeling just grew stronger, and then things started getting weird. I noticed a strange mist forming around me, which was odd because the day was clear. The temperature dropped suddenly, and the forest became eerily silent. No birds, no wind, just silence. And that's when I saw it. About 30 feet away from me, partially obscured by the mist, there was a figure. It was hard to make out clearly, but it seemed to flicker in and out of existence. It wasn't moving. It was just standing there, watching me. I was frozen in place, not sure if I was seeing things or if it was real. After what felt like an eternity, I mustered up the courage to move, and as soon as I took a step, the figure vanished, and the mist started to dissipate. The normal sounds of the forest slowly returned, and so did the normal temperature. I rushed back to the trailhead, constantly looking over my shoulder. I have never experienced anything like this before. I know Maine has its share of folklore and ghost stories, but I've always been a skeptic. Now I'm not so sure. Has anyone else experienced something like this in Maine or anywhere else? I'm trying to make sense of what I saw and felt. Any insights or similar experiences would be greatly appreciated. The Moving Shadows in the Corner So, it was a regular night, and I was just lying in bed scrolling through my phone. You know how it is, winding down. My room was dimly lit by my bedside lamp, and everything was normal. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something odd. It was like a shadow, or more like several shadows, sort of shifting around in the corner of my room. At first, I thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me, because it was late and I was tired. But the more I looked, the more I realized these weren't normal shadows. They were moving, like swirling and twisting, in a way that didn't make any sense, especially because there was nothing moving in my room to cast them. I sat up, trying to focus, thinking maybe it was a trick of the light or something. But no matter how much I changed the lighting, the shadows kept moving, almost like they had a mind of their own. It was like watching dark smoke move in slow motion, but there was no source for it. I got out of bed feeling a mix of curiosity and a creeping sense of dread. As I moved closer, the shadows seemed to react, moving faster, almost as if they were aware of me. That's when I really got freaked out. I turned on every light in the room, but those shadows in the corner, they just stayed there, unaffected by the light. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I looked at that corner, the shadows were there, moving and swirling. In the morning, they were gone. I thought maybe it was all just a dream or my imagination, but it happened again on several other nights. I've tried everything, rearranging my room, getting different curtains, even having a friend stay over to see if they saw it too. They didn't, but I still see it, those weird moving shadows, always out of the corner of my eye. It's gotten to the point where I avoid looking at that corner at night. I don't know what it is, but it definitely has me looking at my room in a whole new way.
gold fever. Camping in the San Juan Mountains was supposed to be an escape, a break from the grind, the rush of the modern world. The first night was uneventful, as I set up camp near an old abandoned mine, just a relic from the days when men came searching for gold. But the second night, things changed. The fire had burnt down to embers, and the darkness pressed in from all sides when I heard them. Footsteps, heavy and deliberate, crunching through the gravel. I strained my ears, half convinced I was imagining things, until voices joined in the footsteps. Gruff, guttural voices, tinged with an air of desperation. As they drew closer, my rational mind sought rational explanations. Late night hikers, perhaps, or fellow campers. But when they stepped into the clearing, the light from my dying fire revealing their form, I knew I was neither rational nor alone. They were men, or at least they used to be, dressed in tattered rags, their faces gaunt and covered in grime. They carried pickaxes and shovels, their eyes hollow yet gleaming with a maniacal glint. Prospectors, remnants of a bygone era. You there, the one in front, the apparent leader rasped, pointing his pickaxe at me. You're on our claim. I, I didn't know, I stammered, cold sweat trickling down my spine. I can leave. Leave? No. You help us dig, he snarled, his grip tightening on his pickaxe. We're close, so close. You help us find it or you'll never leave. I glanced at the old mine, its gaping entrance now seeming like the maw of some dark beast, ready to swallow me whole. And yet, what choice did I have? Saying no to a living person was one thing, denying a ghost was another. They handed me a shovel, its form solidifying as I took it, becoming as real as the dread that filled me. We entered the mine, the walls closing in as we delved deeper into the mountain. The air grew thick, heavy, with the scent of damp earth, and something else. Rot, decay, the smell of dreams long dead. We reached a chamber where the leader stopped, his eyes scanning the walls as if reading an invisible map only he could see. Dig, he ordered, and dig we did our tools biting into the earth, each shovel full a testament to our shared desperation. Time lost meaning as I dug, my hands blistering, my muscles aching, my mind numb. How did I end up here? What in the world was I doing? Was this some kind of hallucination? Just when I thought I couldn't go on, my shovel struck something, something hard and metallic, I fell to my knees, clawing at the dirt, and there it was, a nugget of gold, its surface marred by years of neglect, but gold nonetheless. The leader snatched it out of my hands. His eyes widened, and his face contorted into an expression of pure, unadulterated joy. We found it, he whispered, holding the nugget up for his crew to see. We finally found it. The tension broke, replaced by cheers and laughter, celebration of an endeavor fulfilled, a quest completed. As they reveled, they began to fade, their forms becoming translucent, dissolving into wisps of light that ascended toward the ceiling of the chamber and disappeared into the rock. I was alone, my breathing ragged, my hands covered in dirt, a single nugget of gold lying at my feet. I picked it up, its weight incongruent with the ordeal I had just experienced, a token of a reality I could scarcely believe. The hike back to my camp was a blur, each step a struggle, fueled by a newfound respect for the tenacity of the human spirit, living or otherwise. I packed up, left the gold nugget on a stone near the entrance of the mine, a tribute to the men who had searched for it who had given their all and more to find it. It didn't seem like it would be right to take it.
unexplained voices from the basement. Okay, so this is something straight out of a horror movie, and it happened to me. I never really believed in the whole paranormal thing, but this incident, well, let's just say it changed my mind. I was home alone one evening, just chilling and watching TV. When I heard it, this faint, indistinct mumbling coming from somewhere. I muted the TV, trying to figure out where it was coming from. It sounded like whispers, and it was coming from the basement. Now, I'm not usually the type to get scared easily, but something about this was just off. I mean, it's one thing to hear weird noises, but whispers? That's next level. I gathered my courage, grabbed a flashlight, and headed to the basement. The moment I opened the basement door, the temperature dropped. It was like I was walking into a fridge. The whispers got louder, and I could almost make out words, but not quite. It was like they were speaking a language I couldn't understand. I shone the flashlight around the basement, half expecting to see somebody hiding there. But it was empty. No sign of anyone or anything that could make those sounds. The weirdest part? The moment I stepped back upstairs, the whispers stopped. Just like that. I checked the whole house, even outside, thinking maybe it was some kids playing a prank. But there was nothing. No explanation at all. I've heard those whispers a few more times since then. Always coming from the basement. Always when I'm alone. I've tried recording it, but the sound never shows up on the recordings. It's like whatever it is, it doesn't want to be heard by anyone but me. So that's my story, and I still don't know what to make of it. Maybe it is just the house settling, or maybe it's something else. I do know one thing though, I'm not going down to that basement alone anymore. The Haunted Outback Station by Outback Packer 93. I've traveled through the Australian Outback several times, but my last journey left me with an experience that still haunts my dreams. It happened near an abandoned sheep station, a place where the sunsets paint the sky in fiery hues and the nights are as dark as pitch. I was on a solo road trip, following a dusty trail that cut through the heart of the Outback. I planned to camp near this old sheep station that I'd heard about from a local in town. They said it was abandoned decades ago, left to the mercy of time and the harsh outback elements. I arrived at the station as the sun began to dip lower, just below the horizon. The place was a crumbling relic, its once busy yards now overtaken by the wild. I set up camp, cooked a simple meal, and settled in for the night. As twilight deepened, I noticed something odd. There was a figure standing near the old water tank, a silhouette barely discernible in the fading light. Thinking it must just be another traveler or a local, I called out a greeting. No response. The figure just stood there, motionless. Curiosity overcame me, and I grabbed my flashlight, heading toward the figure. As I got closer, the air grew inexplicably colder, a chill that seeped into my bones. The figure became clearer. It was a man, dressed in what looked like old-fashioned shepherding garb, his face obscured by the shadow of his hat. I stopped a few meters away, unsure of what to say or do. Then, the figure slowly lifted its head, and I saw its face, or rather, the lack of it. Where features should have been, there was only an empty void, a darkness deeper than the night around us. Fear gripped me, rooting me to the spot. The figure took a step forward, and as it did, it began to fade, becoming more and more translucent until it vanished altogether, leaving nothing but the cold night air 
and a lingering sense of dread. Obviously, I didn't sleep that night. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential specter. As soon as the first light of dawn broke over the horizon, I packed up and left, not stopping until I reached the bustle of a nearby town. Later, I learned that the station had a tragic past. Decades ago, a young shepherd had vanished while out in the fields. His body was never found, and it was said that his spirit still wandered the outback, forever bound to the land he once tended. The Great Ocean Road by Macy L. It was during my time as a backpacker in Australia when I stumbled upon something I still can't quite explain. I had been traveling along the Great Ocean Road, soaking in the breathtaking views and the sense of freedom. One evening, I decided to camp near the Twelve Apostles, those magnificent rock formations that rise majestically from the Southern Ocean. I set up my tent on a secluded patch of land, away from the usual tourist spots. The night was clear, and the stars were particularly bright, adding to the sense of serenity of the place. However, as I settled into my tent, an uneasy feeling crept over me. It was a sensation that I couldn't shake off, a sense of being watched. Around midnight, I heard a strange noise outside my tent. It wasn't an animal. It was a soft, rhythmic tapping, like someone gently knocking on a door. I thought it might be another traveler, perhaps lost or in need of help, so I unzipped my tent to look out. What I saw was baffling. There was a figure standing near the edge of the cliff, silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was tall and slender, and seemed to be looking out at the sea. I called out, asking if they needed help, but the figure didn't respond. It just stood there, eerily still. Curiosity overcame my initial apprehension, and I decided to approach. As I got closer, the figure turned toward me. That's when I realized this was no ordinary person. Its features were indistinct, almost like a shadow, but with a faint luminosity that seemed to be from somewhere else. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding. The figure didn't seem threatening, but its presence alone was intimidating. It then raised what seemed like an arm and pointed out toward the sea before turning back and vanishing into thin air. I was left standing there with my mind racing. I looked toward where it had pointed, but I saw nothing unusual. The sea was calm, and the Twelve Apostles stood silently in the distance. I didn't sleep much that night. In the morning, I asked around in the nearest town, but nobody had heard of anything like what I had described. Some locals did share tales of ghostly sightings and strange occurrences along the coast, but nothing matched my experience, and to this day, I don't know how to explain it. Something in the Outback by Roger L. I've never been one to believe in the supernatural, but what I experienced during my trip to the Australian Outback changed everything. It started as a typical adventure. I was camping in a remote area, miles away from the nearest town. The first few nights were peaceful, filled with stargazing and the sounds of nature. But on the fourth night, things took a bizarre turn. I was awakened by an eerie, pulsating light outside my tent. Initially, I thought it was someone with a flashlight, but the light was too bright, and it seemed to hover in midair. Cautiously, I unzipped my tent and peered out. What I saw was inexplicable. 
a luminous orb-like object was floating a few feet off the ground. It wasn't any drone or aircraft I was familiar with. The orb was emitting a soft humming sound and its light pulsated rhythmically, casting strange shadows on the ground. Frozen in fear and curiosity, I watched as the orb began to move. It glided effortlessly over the terrain, pulsing occasionally as if it were surveying the area. My mind raced with questions. Was this some kind of unexplained natural phenomenon or something more otherworldly? The orb then started to approach my tent. As it got closer, I felt a strange sensation, like a static charge in the air. My skin tingled and the hair on my arms stood on end. I didn't know whether to run or stay put. Suddenly, the orb stopped, hovering just a few feet away from me. I could see its surface now. It seemed to be made of some translucent material, and within it, I could discern faint swirling patterns of light. And then, as quickly as it appeared, the orb shot up into the sky and vanished into the night. I stood there in the silence of the outback, completely baffled by what I had just witnessed. The rest of the night was uneventful, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was filled with questions. What was that orb? Why did it come here? Why was I the only one who had seen it? In the morning, I packed up my gear and headed to the nearest town. I inquired with locals about what I had seen, but nobody seemed to have any explanation. To this day, all I have is questions and an experience that I will likely never forget. The Yowie by Indignant Sloth 023. For years, I had heard stories of the Yowie, Australia's version of Bigfoot, but I'd always dismissed them as folklore. That changed during a camping trip in the dense eucalyptus forests of New South Wales. I was exploring a remote area, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. The forest was dense, the air filled with the scent of eucalyptus. It was the perfect escape from city life, or so I thought. On the second night, something unusual happened. I was sitting by the campfire, the only source of light in the pitch black forest. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, too heavy to be a small animal. I initially thought that it might be a kangaroo or a lost hiker, but then the rustling grew louder, closer, Curious and a bit unnerved, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it toward the noise. The light caught something, or someone, standing at the edge of the trees. It was tall, easily over two meters, and covered in thick, dark fur. For a moment, I froze, trying to process what I was seeing. The creature was humanoid, but not human. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, giving them a ghostly glow. It stood there, watching me, its chest rising and falling with deep, slow breaths. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature turned and vanished into the forest. The underbrush shook violently as it retreated, leaving behind a heavy silence. I didn't sleep that night, and at first light I packed up and left. Along the way, I saw large, unusual footprints near my campsite, deeper and larger than any human could make. Later, I did some research, and I found the tales of the Yowie, how it's apparently been seen for generations in these forests. Most locals just take it as a mystery that was better left alone, and I decided that maybe they were right. The Shadow in the Yard by Marcus 
So I've always been the kind of guy who enjoys a good horror movie, but I never actually believed in that stuff. Ghosts, shadows, all that, just fun and games, right? That was until something bizarre happened in my own backyard. I moved into this decent house in a small town in Colorado. It had a big backyard, which was perfect for my dog, Max. Every night, I'd let Max out for his final bathroom break before bed. This routine was normal, until one night, something caught me off guard. It was around 11 p.m., and I was standing on the back porch while Max did his thing. I looked up at the night sky, admiring the stars, when I noticed a dark shape near the back fence. It looked like a tall, thin shadow, just standing there. Weird, right? But I brushed it off, thinking it was probably just a trick of the light or a tree casting a weird shadow. But then, the next night I saw it again. Same spot, same eerie still shape. Max started barking like crazy, which he never does. He's a chill dog, so this freaked me out. I grabbed a flashlight and aimed it toward the shadow. The light seemed to just pass through it. The shadow didn't have any details, just a dark, human-like figure. Now I'm not one to scare easily, but this was getting to me. I started keeping an eye out during the day, but I never saw anything out of the ordinary. It was only at night, always in the same spot. I talked to a neighbor about it, half joking, half hoping for some logical explanation. He went pale and told me that the previous owner of my house had mentioned something similar, said he thought his backyard was haunted. I laughed it off, but deep down, I was starting to wonder. Things escalated one night when I decided to confront it. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe that I could scare it off or find out it was just a weird shadow. I walked toward it, Max barking and growling behind me. As I got closer, the air got colder, and I felt this pressure around me, like walking underwater. I stopped a few feet away from it, and the shadow, it moved. It was subtle, like a slow inhale and exhale. I freaked out and ran back to the house with Max and locked the door. I didn't sleep much that night. After that, I saw it every night. I tried taking pictures, but they all came out blurry, or with just the fence and no shadow at all. I even called a friend over to see it, but of course, that night it didn't show up. It made me look like a fool. Eventually, I couldn't handle it anymore. I started staying up late, watching TV, anything to avoid going out there at night. I sold the house about six months later. The real estate agent asked why I was moving so soon. I just told her I needed a change of scenery. 